All right. Um, I can maybe also do a talk about how to build shit, but maybe that's for some other day after the beers. Um, well, first, thanks to the great people from Doodle for the warm welcome. Thanks for everybody else to going through the heat and bearing with me for half an hour. So, um, what will you kill for? Money. Money. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. So, I personally, I think I would kill for protecting my own life and my family's life. That's about where it ends and starts, um, unlike some other people. So people get killed for iPhones, at least if you Google killed for iPhone, this happens um, all over the world. It's a tragedy. Um, it's not exactly the same if you look for Samsung Galaxy. <laughs> but it could be worse. So the product could actually kill you. <laughs> um, but what, what I'm going at is actually that people get killed for things they value or value they want to protect. Um, and so where we are is to build shit people would kill for is focus on value. I mean, we're, um, I'm a product manager. Maybe a few, many of you are as well, I guess. Um, focusing on value is the name of the game. However, in my life at least, um, as a PM, I've been looked at as a project manager or similar. I've been looked at as, um, well, taking care of other people in some other way. Um, the typist or ticket manager and uh, basically documentation monkey, if you want. Um, the testing guy and uh, a lot of other things. So. Seriously, um, over the course of my few jobs as a product manager and from my experience, this is all actually not really valuable work. Um, it's necessary work, it's grunt work, it has to be done. But um, I would ask all product managers to ask uh, to look inwards strongly and think, is this the main thing that I'm doing? Is this stuff that I do most of my time? And am I actually contributing enough value to the company that hired me to manage a product, since the title product manager already includes managing, and the product is what you should be managing. Just doing these administrative tasks is probably not what you should be focusing most of your time on. Um, I've been there myself. I've overcommitted to doing these kind of things, and I have this talk to actually plead to everybody to look in, inwards uh, if they're product managers and actually think hard where they spend their time uh, to provide the most value to your business. So, but let's go back to the iPhone case and let's discover a bit um, economies of, of, of iPhones. It's very simple, uh, so don't worry, you don't need a degree in, or an MBA anyway. So the blue columns are the costs of iPhones to produce these machines. Uh, the orange ones are the range people pay for this. And we see that that's the green line, that's the multiple about between cost and, and the price. So that's in everything in between is basically the profit that Apple is making on a phone. Uh, we see that it's around 800-ish as an average um, price. So fair enough, we know Apple is a very successful business. To run a good business, we need something like this, right? We need a um, larger price than cost. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but where does this come from that uh, people are actually willing to pay 800 bucks for a phone which basically has the same features as a phone that has the price of 200, say, uh, Samsung Galaxy or something else? Users, people who buy products, attribute much more value to this product that, than they attribute to the price, basically. So there's another multiple there that we have to think about. I think this is the multiple that is most interesting for us as product managers, when we think about user value, or well, how much is our product contributing to this, um, to this value? And the other part, which is also to be kept in mind, is of course the business side. So um, when I think about product management, I actually have this yin yang uh, picture in mind. Uh, one part fulfilling user's value, uh, creating user value basically, fulfilling the user needs. One part, creating value for the business, uh, can be revenue. Businesses can also decide that value is different. So depending on your stage, you might value user growth much higher than actually revenue. 
most Silicon Valley startups actually work that way in the beginning. So I guess you should be f familiar with that. That's where we have these nice curves of user growth. Um, subsequently, then also with revenue growth. For me, this is the, the starting point. Um, from there, you can use quite a lot of tactics and things that you might know about. You can Google them if you don't. Uh, we can have another few talks about all these uh, words if you want. Um, the main point is you need to know actually when to apply these tactics, not know as much as possible of these tactics. So I'll let you read this quote. All right, so picking the most valuable, most leveraged things is what is a good definition of being a manager, as a product manager especially, since you have many people who you work with in your product teams, and you're basically also dictating where they are investing their time to contribute to the value for the user and for the business. Um, when I think about day-to-day -day activity of, uh, of project, uh, product management, it is this picture, I think, uh, from Marty Kagan from Silicon Valley Product Group, who actually mashed in some parts here which you might know from Henrik Knieberg, who's an agile coach for Spotify and Lego. So this is the famous skateboard, whatever, bicycle, then car um, metaphor that most of you have probably seen when talking about agile. Um, and this is partly where my title for the talk actually originated, so this continuous discovery and continuous delivery. In the engineering track, you might have heard something about continuous delivery. At least in the previous years, there was plenty of talk about that. If you, you wanted to know about Circle CI and blah, 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 there was a lot of stuff. So what I would like to do this time, because we also have a product track this time, so we want to talk about continuous discovery a bit more and how to do this and actually how to select the most valuable thing to build next. since. As product managers, this is what we should be doing, um, but not only us. I guess you don't know where you want to go if you don't know where you want to go. So having an objective is where this whole thing starts. You can also see it, it is like the first thing up on the top left. Uh, you need an objective. Anybody of you who is working with OKRs will have an easy time to identify a good objective to follow. Um, or just a key result in this case. If you want to know more about OKRs, I'll do a pitch for a talk that is happening right after this. Um, Micha Jan from Tutti is talking about their experience with OKRs at five past four. I think it's upstairs um, in the other building. So start with an objective, of course. Um, then in the discovery, it is basically about laying out all the options you potentially would have. And this is basically already a key message to take away. <laughs> um, too often we go from objective to solution and then implement that and wonder why it did not work. Or even worse, we actually go from solution to potentially tying it to some other objective and then also wondering why it didn't work. Not a surprise, actually. Um, in my world, product managers should be spending on discovery or exploration of what should be next should be spending like 20, no, should be spending like 80 to 90% of their time, actually. Um, I know from experience, from being there myself, that this is much lower. And I know from talking to colleagues that this is much lower. Um, reading up a bit on the best product teams uh, in the world, in Facebook, and you name all the Silicon Valley superstars, they manage to spend this amount of time on discovery. They manage to churn out like 20 experiments each week. Um, I don't know if you can hold the pace. I certainly know from my previous jobs that we never met managed to get that high in experiments. Um, and it's, it's a high bar. So the one thing it tells us is basically that this phase is about learning fast. It's not news to anybody, of course. Um, but really emphasizing on learning fast and doing the things in a way that can be done fast, which often means not code. So learning at the end of the code process is, is, is way too slow because development, if we go through the agile, iterative process and so on, we have 
hopefully engineers spending most of their time here, like 70 to 80%, I would hope, and PMs only spending like 20 to 30% of their time here. Uh, this is where I see there's a fundamental misunderstanding sometimes between PMs and the role of a PO in the Agile process. Yes, we are often that role, but this is not a 100% job for us. Since we own the product, we manage the product, we have other aspects to take care of, uh, especially the revenue side often, and also sometimes product marketing, which would be a good idea. So um, what I actually didn't say here in discovery, I would also quote uh, my friend Marty Kagan, which is if you're only using your engineers for development, you're only getting 50% of their value. So the engineers are probably the most important members of the team in the discovery when it comes to ideation and finding actually things you want to build and doing innovation because they are the ones who can connect technology with user needs. So our job becomes basically presenting the user needs to the people who actually can do innovation because our ideas are great, but their ideas are usually much better. So back to here. When building things that arrive in this stage become very, very, very expensive because we have engineers building it, we have a whole team designing it, putting it into production, maintaining it from there on and so on. So only things should arrive in development that we have validated, that we have vet, vetted um, for being valuable to the user and to the business. That said, how can we do this? We have a great framework which I like to use. It's called the Opportunity Solution Tree. Um, it's by Teresa Torres. There's a link there. I will share the slides, obviously. Um, it is basically breaking down your business outcome you want to achieve into things that influence this, which she calls opportunities. Um, and then for these opportunities, find solutions how to actually implement this. And then implement it? No. Find experiments that you can actually test if your implementation idea, your solution is actually viable and can be done. Main takeaway here is obviously on each level, there's always multiple boxes. It gets broken down more and more. Uh, there's not just like one, 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 um, which often happens. So what is this? Basically, it's four layers. It's the desired outcome. It's the business uh, value that you're going to generate. This is obviously can be something like a KR uh, metric that you agreed on that you want to increase. 13% more conversion on whatever you're selling or whatever random other metric. Um, opportunities, and notice on the lower three ones that it's plural again, right? Come up with more than one. Just be a bit creative there and not just go for the single first solution you come to your mind. Opportunities, I like to think about opportunities mostly as jobs to be done. So from a design perspective, if you know the framework, uh, those things do not change so much over time, so finding a time to meet for Doodle is a thing that people have been doing all their life. For hundreds of years, people have tried to meet, they needed to find a time to meet, how did they agree on it? Multiple ways, at some point in the offices people used to call each other, used to send emails, now most people use Doodle. Well, yeah. Um, then. Uh, once you identified basically the job to be done, like time to meet or, I don't know, cross an ocean or something like that, you could find solutions to do that and find experiments to obviously support that. So let's maybe run through this fictitious example of sailing across the Atlantic, which is trivial enough to understand without any context of any business. Uh, but let's say you're Columbus and the Queen has told you to sail across the ocean and find new land a shorter path to India, of course, or China. Um, so with sailing in those days comes slightly problematic things like scurvy and navigating and there's rats on the ship eating all your food and all these kind of things that you have to take care of. Uh, with the solution, uh, opportunity solution tree, it would look a bit like this. So preventing scurvy, skorbut for German speakers. Um, you could test fruit like apples, oranges, lemons, whatnot, and figure out what will work and what will help. So maybe an A-B test with apples and oranges sounds reasonable. Um, navigating 
We don't need to test too much. We know that compasses and stars are already well used in, in navigation. This is also something that you might learn, is not always you need to test everything, validate everything, find everything. If you already know the solution and it will work in 80% of the time, maybe roll with it, save some time. Um, on the other hand, let's say killing rats on a ship, uh, we also know the solution already. Dogs do a very crappy job at that. Uh, cats do a really good job at that. Obviously, as Christoph mentioned before, best product ever. Cats. All right. So this slide's design is absolutely not influenced by my vacation in Sweden last week. Um, here is how do you identify what to prioritize to do first. Thinking of being in a business, we want to keep down things that we do not want to do. So um, reducing whatever is not wanted and not valued by the user and will not work for the business. So basically avoiding failure. Uh, in our business, we know that like nine out of 10 things fail anyway. So this is already a hard ask. But at least improving the odds a little bit that it's not 10 out of 10, these four risks are helpful. So maybe it translates better into four questions that you could ask and that resonate better with you and me. So could the user figure out how to use it is basically the usability question. It's also where most of the tests would start out. You find out, you show the user a product. Can he actually find out what to do with it? Yes or no. You need to start there because you will otherwise not be able to answer the second question. Will they actually use it, which means they see a value in it and they want to also use it, maybe even pay for it. And then these questions often get overlooked and um, can they actually build it? Maybe from recent experiences at Doodle, we have also ventured into uh, Kafka territory. I don't know if there's a talk by my esteemed colleague, Philippe, who will also talk at four o'clock about our Kafka experience and moving our architecture there. Highly recommended to the technical folk. Um, also, one of our learning was don't start on something when you don't know exactly how to do it. So this is the how can we actually build it, but this might also translate to completely other things, um, as maybe you don't want to build it for ethical reasons, for GDPR reasons, for all these kind of things that might come in there. Um, and does this product actually match our business? So do we actually really want this in our product line? Does this generate the revenue we want? We heard earlier in the Google talk, they have a lot of good ideas that just don't match the scale that they need. This is clearly the way when Google will shoot that product, although it's a good product, it's just not big enough. That's a problem, nice problem to have if you Google. Uh, we'd all love to have that one, I guess. All right, so if you can tick all these boxes, you actually have produced something with value. Uh, you will ship it and you will actually be able to at least explain to your bosses why you're uh, using all these resources in the development process. And I think if you manage to actually go through the, all of these on each and everything you ship, you're also sub-optimizing for uh, discovery, of course. So you should spend a lot of time on discovery, and you should also spend a lot of time on general on discovery, but not on each item, right? You should keep in mind to move fast through these questions. Um, which is also the value you bring to your company. So main point taken in value as a PM, I think, which I learned over time, is focus on things that you leverage highest as a, as a manager, right? Picking the right things means investing more time in finding the right things and not necessarily pushing the things through the pipeline that have already been decided as being valuable. Um, this is... The summary, I guess, um, we could call it, or just a cheat sheet. So start with the objective. Um, if you have a good organization and it actually is working already in an OKR fashion and it has a lot of things to give you in terms of objectives, you probably don't have to spend too much time there. If not, everything else becomes moot. You have to start there. You have to spend more than zero amount of time on it. So you get this objective. And then move into discovery. Spend most of your time there, 80%, hopefully more. As a product manager, you will be there. You will be learning fast. You will be answering these four questions. So once it actually hits the development side of things, 
they, meaning the engineers, can actually answer these other questions around scalability, reliability, performance, and maintainability, which I think is also very valuable. You don't want products in production that are crashing all the time. So this is about building it right. And I think this is where also a lot of the confusion often comes about, that we see uh, the learnings only at the end of this third point on the slide, uh, when we actually have built it already. And then we learn that it was not really valuable. It was not helpful for the users. So we have to shoot it, and then it becomes something that is very expensive to shoot. Uh, because a lot of energy went into it, and everybody loves it already because they put their love into it and their work into it. So it's much easier to kill stuff a bit earlier in the process. So um, I also put this whole process into a nice air table, which I happily will share with you. It's, I mean, the link is in the slides. There's a nice button top, top right if you want to copy it and use it. Um, it I've named the tabs basically along this process. It is outcomes, jobs to be done, hypothesis and experiments, which is, yeah, along the four levels of um, what I was talking about in the opportunity solution tree. And this has been used by me. <laughs> if you want to use it, feel free. If you want to give me feedback on this or on anything else I said, on improving my process, I would be more than grateful. If you want to discuss how your process works, I'm even more grateful. And if you manage to go and provide value for your users and for your business and come back next year and talk about it at TX, I will be even more grateful because I'm really happy to hear about it. So thank you very much. <laughs>